Good morning. This presentation will be explored within the global politics challenge of security with the key concepts of legitimacy and sovereignty. It will be examined at the state and local level of analysis. The question being asked in this presentation is that to what extent do NGOs intervene in the state's sovereignty? To start off, NGOs are not governmental organizations, a nonprofit group that functions independently of any government. NGOs, sometimes called civil societies, are organized on community, national, and international levels to serve a social or political goal, such as human, humanitarian causes or the environment. My case study is Amnesty International in India. Amnesty was founded in 1961 in London, following the publication of the article The Forgotten Prisoners by the lawyer Peter Benenson. The state mission of the organization is to campaign for a world in which every person enjoys all of human rights enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other international human rights instruments. Amnesty at the moment is active in more than 150 countries with over 8 million people as its members. It was also awarded the Nobel, Prize, Nobel Peace Prize in 1977 for its defense of human dignity against torture. So um, the network of Amnesty is pretty big with more than 8 million members. Amnesty in India. Amnesty has actively advocated for human rights in India from the beginning till now. They have continued to raise voice against the violations of human rights. Amnesty has recently been put under fire, allegedly after reporting the events of the Delhi riots that took place in the late 2019 to early 2020 time. Amnesty reported that the Delhi police were misusing their powers. They were seen beating, beating up protesters, torturing the detainees, and joining the far-right Hindu mobs in riots. There was also an instance where a shooter was let go and protected by the police rather than them arresting him. It was said that the police had a bias towards the Hindu rioters and also helped them. One shopkeeper alleged that police gave stones to him and other Hindus to throw at Muslims over the road. Um, another Muslim man whose home and shop across the street were burned down also alleged that the police acted with Hindus against Muslims. The official amnesty report said that the riot that seemed far from spontaneous saw almost three times the number of Muslim casualties compared to Hindus. Muslims also bore the burnt um, of loss of business and property. So we have seen amnesty's work in India as um, giving reports which are honest. And if not honest, according to the far right um, government, they are biased. But in many instances, we, we also have proof to, uh, to prove, prove them right and um, go with the narrative that in this case, that the police was um, with, on the side of the Hindu protesters. How do these um, large scale NGOs affect the legitimacy and sovereignty of the state? The controversial element of large-scale development um, NGOs in relation to so state sovereignty comes in those occasions which NGOs provide services which are traditionally seen to be the work of the state. In some cases, this is not controversial. For example, um, developing countries which have experienced a major natural disaster where immediate relief is urgently needed because the NGOs can be the first responses where the government can't reach immediately. Uh, because these NGOs work at the grassroots level and they can help the um, masses in a much more faster and effective way than the government. However, in other cases where NGOs are involved in more long-term provision of services, their impact on state sovereignty can be seen as problematic. Perhaps the main reason for this is that they undermine the relationship between the state and the citizen and frequently undermine the sovereignty of political issues. Whilst this is done with the best of immediate intentions, writers such as Riddle, which wrote in 2014, have argued that the long-term impact of this can be damaging both to the actual conditions in a particular country, because the NGOs present a more effective way. So if the NGOs are taken away, the masses will be left with a lot of shock because they don't expect their state to not be doing that. But also the... Um, actual conditions, but also the political strength and accountability of the state, because the state will be held more accountable by the citizens. 
The argument goes that by taking over services which the state could provide, NGOs undermine the long-term planning and development of the state and effectively make it reliant on NGOs for service provision. In many cases, we've seen that the NGOs are held responsible for something that the state should be doing, which is wrong and um, which takes away the role of the state and the citizen and creates a gap between the two. Amnesty International um, sovereignty and legitimacy. Amnesty, in terms of amnesty, uh, it has been treated as a threat to state sovereignty and legitimacy because of its interference in the government proceedings by writing articles and raising opinions, which, as may many say, provoke people to think otherwise of the government. We've seen that in India happen, and because of that, after the Delhi riots, amnesty was shut down and their bank accounts have been frozen in terms of um, giving the reason that they are a threat to India and its culture. Amnesty has also been criticized by many states on the other hand with the claims of selection bias as well as ideology and foreign pol uh, policy bias against either non-Western countries or Western supported countries. Governments that have criticized Amnesty International include those of Israel, um, Democratic Republic of Congo, China, Vietnam, and many more, which have complained about Amnesty International for what they assert is one-sided reporting or a failure, of treat, a failure to treat threats to security as a mitigating factor. The actions of these governments and of other governments critical of Amnesty International have been the subject of human rights concerns voiced by Amnesty. The Catholic Church has also criticized amnesty for its stance on abortion, particularly in Catholic majority countries. We have seen that amnesty has been a very, um, as many may say, modern or um, radical uh, NGOs because in Catholic majority countries, we, we don't see much, many NGOs supporting abortion because of the conservative point of view on life. There have been many controversies around amnesty as well, including payout controversies, prostitution, decriminalization, workplace bullying, among many more. Amnesty has been under fire for their um, work environment and, um, a, and many payouts where they paid the people who were seeking help in, uh, in order to have a deal with them sort of that um, they can do they don't ask for much and they can settle for less which as we have seen that amnesty is a human rights ngo should not be taken well amnesty in addition to many other ngos are being called a threat to sovereignty because these organizations hold a lot of power and um, trust among the masses but legally can't be held for much because um, people to escape their income taxes or to turn their black money into white, they donate to NGOs, which help them um, cheat the state, which is again, um, a sort of threat to legitimacy of the government because of the independent interdependence of the NGO with the state. If the NGO is collapsing in a way, then the state will be uh, in trouble and with NGOs which are as large scale as Amnesty, this is a threat. Should the state allow NGOs to continue? Um, we both we have both pros and cons of NGOs, and in many cases the um, the pros outweigh the cons. The conclusion on this case study that can be made is that Amnesty International has been a helpful way in helpful in many ways to fight for human rights, not only in India, but in many other countries. But the questions about its legitimacy have always been raised by many individuals and, and states. Big scale NGOs can threaten a state's sovereignty, but if the state makes laws and keep them in check, the result might be different. The state and the NGOs can cooperate and solve many problems and challenges existing in the society because NGOs work at a grassroots level and they help um, the masses more than the state can do in many cases because they provide services which are personalized and in many cases customized. Um, pros of and having NGOs as, um, as a part of the state is uh, NGOs help in filling the gap of the citizens and the governments in many ways because mostly they work from a grassroots level as mentioned before and um, 
They use minimal operating costs and they are flexible and quick in their responses. They help in creating a society which is aware and knowledgeable of their rights and of uh, this of their surroundings. Uh, and they can also uh, use and they can also be used as a test bed for the government policies and programs, which is a really important factor of having NGOs because the state can test out what what their citizens might be uh, in favor of and might not be in favor of, and NGOs are the best way to do that. The cons that we have with NGOs um, are that they have a really controversial element of large scale development NGOs in relation to uh, state sovereignty when it comes uh, to those occasions in which NGOs provide services which are traditionally seen as the role of the state. So if the state is um, meant to provide those roles, the NGOs are undermining the state and they are providing the services and that can be a problem for the state in long term. By remaining unaccountable to direct power, uh, state power, they are able to challenge the power of the state in numerous ways. Only the NGOs associated with high profile um, politicians and bureaucrats in India get hefty uh, government funds. So the states, uh, the NGOs in India don't get a lot of funds unless they're associated with somebody who is um, really high profile or um, they, uh, they have sources that, that that can get them funds, which is a very big con to the NGO industry as a whole, uh, not an industry, but to NGOs as a whole. And um, we should be looking at it more on a um, side of the pros because and if we work with NGOs and if we cooperate with them and if we make rules that are in favor of state, we can help the masses a lot. Thank you so much.